All right, folk, well, welcome. We come to session eight on Ezra, which, uh, strangely enough, is actually on chapter eight as well. Uh, we, I know we, I think, lumped uh, chapters six and seven together. After a little digression last week to Eritrea, we're back to Ezra. And it's certainly my plan, God willing, to wrap that up in the next three weeks uh, by the 20th of November. And then we'll break again for the uh, missions focus uh, on the 27th of November, which uh, Cyril will be handling on Vietnam. So we're really mm -hmm. trying to find some nice Vietnamese food to enjoy on that evening. But uh, that's what uh, we try and do as a family, at least. But uh, yeah, so Ezra for this evening, and uh, let's uh, pray and uh, pray that the Lord would come and speak to us and encourage us as we come to these reflections on his word this evening. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity at the end of another Lord's Day to just gather, to slow down, to connect uh, with each other, uh, with uh, your word open in front of us. We're thankful, Lord, for the timeless truth that you have given to us. And uh, Lord, for your goodness in preserving that through the millennia. And that what we open up here is not just dry and dusty Israelite history. It's not myths and fantasies and philosophies of men. But uh, this is the true and living word of God. And Lord, we're thankful for using Ezra in recording this and uh, jotting down these things as the Spirit guided him. And uh, Lord, we can still see the principles and the life-giving truth applicable to our own era, to our own church, uh, to ministry, to missions. And uh, Father, we do pray this evening to stir us in terms of our own faith. And uh, as we respond to what you would say to us through this passage, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Uh, if we weren't muted and blacked out and hiding behind our screens with our mute buttons, I'd actually ask you to try and identify who that was. Uh, but uh, it's a little difficult on this platform. Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Those are the words that are attributed to the wonderful and well-known missionary to India, William Carey. Uh, Kerry is well known in terms of his sacrificial ministry to the nation of India. Uh, he arrived in Calcutta in 1793 and uh, soon after that moved into the interior and his work centered on the, the city of Sarampal. And uh, Kerry spent 41 years in India without a furlough. Uh, so just worked pretty much incessantly on the missions field in that way. Over the period of 41 years, his mission counted just 700 converts in a nation of absolute millions. So I guess in terms of contemporary analysis and KPIs and performance indexes and so forth, uh, he would be regarded as hopelessly unsuccessful in terms of ministry. But having said that, Kerry laid an impressive foundation of Bible translation, of education, of uh, social reform. He certainly tackled some of the absolutely horrific and godless and wicked practices uh, within the nation as well and uh, certainly brought a Christianized worldview into certain areas. Mm -hmm. But Akiri has been referred to as the father of modern missions. Uh, if you're familiar at least with Andrew Fuller's work as a Baptist pastor in the, U, in the UK and England, uh, Fuller was largely responsible for the establishment of the London Missionary Society as a Baptist and uh, was integrally, integrally involved in actually getting and catapulting Kerry and others onto the mission field. But having said that, in, uh, in the late 18th century, William Kerry preached what would be an incredibly influential sermon in which he encouraged his hearers to, exactly what I quoted, expect great things from God and to attempt great things for God. Kerry's challenge quite simply was aimed at, at rousing the church of his day from complacency particularly in regard to the theme of or the idea of foreign missions, which was still in its fledgling state at the time. And as he saw it from his perspective, Christians were not attempting great things for God because he wasn't ex they weren't expecting him to do great things in them and through them and in many cases despite them. In, in, in many ways, the well-known verse from Ephesians 3 verse 20 was well-known and well-loved. God is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or even think. But that wasn't panning out in reality. There wasn't actually a, uh, a faith-based and a trust-based response to the Lord to actually do the great things that he promised in his word. And as Kerry and others looked at the church at the time, 
They saw that the actions, or more particularly the lack of action, uh, particularly in the space of evangelism and foreign missions, uh, showed that the church was very insular and very closed and living in a day of small things. It's all about us and our comfort, and not a whole lot has changed uh, from that period. If we look at the church today, it's uh, often uh, the same thing, just uh, about ourselves and self-existence, rather than dreaming big dreams, uh, kingdom-minded dreams. And Kerry's sermon challenged them to expect bigger and greater things from God. Because he knew that if and when the church grabbed onto that idea that God can do, because God is powerful and God is infinite in terms of his resources, that the church would be motivated to step out in faith and to take risks for the cause of Christ. And I dare say that the modern church needs the same reminder and maybe even we this evening at the Rambo Baptist Church need to be stirred in the same way. And in God's providence, our text this evening, Ezra chapter 8, points us in exactly that direction. So focus, as we come to the 8th chapter of Ezra, I just want to, again, put it into context for you. Maybe you haven't been a, a part of the whole Ezra series thus far. We... Uh, See that Ezra is the author of the book, but he himself only entered the narrative in chapter 7, where we were uh, two weeks ago, 60 years after the events of chapter 1. So although he's the scribe and although he's writing down the events under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he himself only enters the fray, in a sense, in chapter 7. And uh, you'll recall that, <clears throat> excuse me, from the introduction uh, that I laid for us way back in the dark mists of time on the 4th of September on, uh, on this uh, platform as we started with the series. So just keep the structure of Ezra in mind. Chapters 1 through to 6 record the return of the first group of es uh, exiles under Shezbazar and Zerubbabel, uh, the two civic, civil leaders, and uh, Yeshua the high priest. And we started to see the rebuilding of the altar and the rebuilding of the temple. Now, Ezra writes about this, but he himself was not directly involved with the work because he didn't arrive in Jerusalem until the temple had actually been built in uh, 458 BC. But, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> but the second half of the book, chapters 7 through to 10, is both biographical and historical, and it deals with the return of the second group of e uh, exiles under Ezra's leadership and his very direct involvement in the reformation of the spiritual life of the nation. So we only really have chapter 7, which is biographical, and then chapters 8, 9, and 10, with Ezra actually in action in various ways. And uh, just by way of historical quirk, that's probably where Ezra and Nehemiah overlapped in terms of their respective uh, involvement. So two weeks ago, we met Ezra for the first time in chapter 7. And his background was provided for us there in chapter 7, verse 6. This Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the law the Lord of Israel had given. And the king granted him all that he asked for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. And then if we jump down a few verses, which is my particular focus on that uh, pre-recorded message a few weeks ago, Ezra 7, verse 10, for Ezra had set his heart, he was committed, he was passionate to study the law of God and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Chapter 8 recounts for us then what actually happened during that second wave of returning exiles. And folk, if you managed to ever read through this chapter beforehand, like I encouraged you to do this morning, mm. you would have seen that verses 1 through to 14 give us the list of those who accompanied Israel. Mm. Just, just, do the maths. I got to, I sat with my abacus this week in my office and got to 1,514 people. And we've got to ask the question, why? Why, why are those long lists, of, uh, long lists there? And again, I just want to remind you that they're there for a reason. Those are family records. They're there because they show the faithfulness of God. God has preserved the line of Messiah from generation to generation to generation. So what we actually see there is a record of God's faithfulness showing that he is committed to the Abrahamic covenant to actually remake Israel into a great nation again. But folks, the interesting thing is this. 1,514 people is small, and it's certainly less than the 50,000 that returned back in the first wave. And remember I mentioned that to you in late September, even that was small. 
Remember, there was a sizable Jewish community uh, back in Babylon. They've been there for seven plus decades and now part of uh, the, the, the Persian Empire. And after another 60 years, so now we're about 130 years after the original exile, they're settled. They're comfortable. They're chilling. They've got a good life. There's absolutely no reason for them to uh, leave their creature comforts and undergo that arduous 1,500-kilometer trip back home, kind of from Cape Point to Randburg, to be part of a reconstruction and development project. All they wanted to do was to, to, to chill to enjoy life and their stability and their comforts and to sell the return to work and build and get your hands dirty and there's discomfort and there's deprivation and so forth and reestablish Israel and Jerusalem and the temple. That's not an easy sell. And uh, so even much later, we see even fewer volunteers rush into the sign-up desk to volunteer to go back with Israel. And again, folk, we can just see the increasing spiritual lethargy and the, the disinterest that is actually prevailing in uh, these people at the time. Mm -hmm. They've lost the glow. They've lost the fire. The zeal has faded because they've been increasingly absorbed into the culture and the lifestyle of Babylon. Mm -hmm. That's not our key focus, but we've got to ask the question, can it happen to us in our Christian lives? And I think, as I've, and I've made the point before, yes, it can. That's an ever-present danger. And so we need to learn from the fact that we can become so absorbed into the culture around us that the need to actually serve the Lord and to be involved in a self-sacrificial way can actually be eroded. But that's not the main point of this chapter. There's something else much more fundamental that we want to put our finger on this evening. What happens as they start to return. What happens as they start to return? Immediately, folk, we see that there is a crisis. They haven't gone very far. They're actually still in Persia. They're still camping on the banks of one of the tributaries of the Euphrates River. And there in chapter 8, verse 15, we read this. I gathered them to the river that runs to Ahava, and there we camped three days. As I reviewed the people and the priests, I found that there were none of the sons of Levi. Ezra immediately identifies that in that small group of 1,514 people, they're lacking priests of the line of Levi. Now, you'll recall from Israelite history and from the law that the Levites were set apart by the Lord and before the Lord to minister to him. The Levites were to serve in the temple. The Levites were there to serve as mediators between the people and God. They were there to assist with the sacrifices they were the ones that were to be involved in the ministry of intercession. They were the ones that were supposed to be blessing people. The Levites, in a, in a nutshell, I guess, were the spiritual leaders. And they should have been the ones at the very forefront of supporting Ezra in terms of a movement back to Jerusalem. And so to have no Levites part of this group was actually a big deficiency. You've got, got absolutely no significant spiritual leadership at all. And Ezra realizes that this is a crisis point. And so effectively, he takes his signal flare gun and he sends an SOS to a community of Jews in Persia, staying pretty close to where they were camping. And we can see that there in chapter 8, verse 16. Then I sent for Eleazar, Ariel, Shemaiah, El-Natan, Yarib, El-Natan, a second one, Natan, Zechariah, and Meshulan, leading men, and for Jurib and El-Natan, who were men of insight. And I sent them to Ido, the leading ma man at the place, Kasivia, telling him what to say to his Ido and his brothers and the temple servants at the place, Kasifia, namely to send us ministers for the house of our God. If I can I maybe just take an absolute tangent for a moment, just because it's close to home for, for us, I guess, and maybe it'll be interesting for you as well. Uh, if you're at all interested in that verse there in uh, chapter 8, verse 16, our two daughters' names actually feature, interestingly. Uh, you can see the second name there is Ariel. Uh, Ar in Hebrew is lion, and uh, El is God. So if you put the two together, you've got Ariel, which is lion of God. So uh, Ariel is just a feminized version of that. And uh, look closely there at the, the, the fourth name and the sixth name, and then the other dude that's mentioned a little, little later as well, El-Natan. El, again, uh, comes from Elohim, 
And Natan is the Hebrew for given. So when you put that together, you've got Al-Natan, which is given by God. But interestingly, uh, there are various forms of that. So um, uh, Natanya uh, would be the same thing. Natan, Ya, Natan uh, with the a shortened form of Yahweh. And interestingly enough, Jonathan is exactly the same name, Yo Natan, uh, Jehovah, shortened, same of, uh, shortened form of Jehovah, linked with Natan. And intriguingly, there's a fourth version of that, and that is the Nathaniel. Natan El uh, is another way of saying that. So this name El Natan can be done in ver various ways, uh, but effectively it means whichever way you want to look at it, God has given. So uh, that was your brief crash course in uh, Hebrew nomenclature for this evening. But having said that, let's come back onto the main road. Uh, Ezra sends this SOS to the community of Jews and pretty much says to them, we need ministers for the house of our God. And the SOS is heard. And again, play with our abacus. Uh, 260 people are sent to assist with the priestly duties. They needed mediators and those who could assist in the spiritual life and the sacrifices and prayers and worship. And that was responded to. And uh, we can actually see that they uh, sent them, those people, to assist. Okay, again, I don't think this is the main point of the chapter, but it's important just to see the need for priests. But as we catapult through the centuries, praise God, we don't need that anymore. We've got our high priest. Christ alone is our mediator. As we are said at Bible Hour this morning, there is only one God. Oh, there is only one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We don't need priests anymore. And in fact, as we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, we as the church are the royal priesthood, the holy nation, the people belonging to God. And uh, that's why as Baptists, we believe in the priesthood of all believers, that we're all gifted, we're all to be involved, and so forth. So uh, as we do life and ministry, we don't need people to come and be injected in to, uh, to minister to us, because we're all ministers, we're all servants, we're all priests, as we use our gifting. But again, that's not the main heartbeat of this chapter. What is? I venture to say to you that the main issue that we want to walk away with this evening is this is to see the faith in action of Ezra and these people. What do we see them doing there on the banks of this river, this tributary of the Euphrates? These exiles settle down to pray and to fast for a three-day period. They come and they show humble dependency on God. But what was their focus? Have a look there at verse 21. Just jump right down to kind of about two-thirds of the way through. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, mm -hmm. our children, and all our goods. Mm -hmm. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, mm -hmm. since we had told the king the hand of our God is good uh, on all who seek him. And the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. As we read between the lines and kind of peer into the, the white spaces, in a sense, in the text, we get the impression that there at Ahava, Ezra was having second thoughts about the wisdom of not having a military escort in light of what lay ahead. Again, folk, we've got to consider the, the distance. We've got a big journey from Cape Point to Randburg, 1,500 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Travel at the time was extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm. In addition to the 1,414 men, there were in all likelihood women and children, the families of those men that were coming along as well. So it was certainly a bigger group than just them. Mm -hmm. Plus, along with that, You've got to understand that they're carrying loot. There's an immense amount of treasure for God's house in the gifts that the king and his counselors and the Jews that remain in Babylon had given to them, which we can see that there in verse 25. Mm -hmm. As we just catapult to the end, mm -hmm. we, we know that they were uh, carrying all this treasure. And I weighed out to them the silver and the gold and the vessels, the offering for the house of our God that the king and his counselors and all his lords and all Israel, their present had offered. So this is what happened all the way back in, in Persia. 
got the king and his counselors and other Israelites who weren't going to come back. They had offered silver and gold and these vessels and offerings and monetary gifts and so forth. Ezra and this cohort had a significant amount of treasure. But Ezra had already told the king with absolute confidence that there's no need for protection. There's no reason for a security detail because the hand of our God is upon those, uh, uh, upon all those for good who seek him. That's what he's told the king. But it seems at this particular point in time, he has this inner war. He debates with him in himself whether it wouldn't be the prudent thing to maybe retract on that and kind of go back cap in hand to Artaxerxes and say, you know what, having thought about it, having considered the dangers and the distance and so forth, maybe it would be a good idea to have a military ex escort. But we can see that Ezra decided against that. It seems that in his own mind, he realized that he couldn't go back on requesting the protection detail. Why? Because Ezra was consumed with a desire for the glory of God. Ezra was jealous for God's honor. God would not be honored if he retracted on the assurance that our God is able, our God is the means, our God is sovereign, our God is powerful, our God is committed to us as a people. And if he goes back, and asks for the protection, God would not be honored by that fearful approach for an escort in light of his previous confidence that God would undertake for them. Now, we've got to just ponder on that this evening. Folk, I would suggest to you that is real courage and that is real daring. That is real faith, great faith in action. To look at the issues and go, our God can and I trust him too, and we're not going to retract and uh, look for human intervention when we're trusting fully in the resources that God alone can provide. What happened? What happened in response to that fasting and that prayer and the, the step of faith that Ezra took there all the way back in Persia? God honored his faith by bringing the whole company safely to Jerusalem. Have a look there at verse 31. Then we departed from the river Ahava on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambushes by the way. We came to Jerusalem, and there we remained three days. On the fourth day, within the house of our God, the silver and the gold and the vessels were weighed into the hands of Meremoth the priest, son of Uriah, and with him was Eleazar, the son of Phinehas, and with them were the Levites, Josabad, the son of Yeshua, and Noadiah, the son of Benui. The whole was counted and weighed, and the weight of everything was recorded. They get it there safely. Folks, this is great faith in action. And God moves through all that arduous journey over the, the lengthy period that they were traveling to work in the situation for the good of his people and ultimately for his own glory. And they get there, they're safe, the treasure's safe, and it's safely delivered. And uh, they can sign off on that delivery. How do the people respond? What do, you, what do you do? What do you say? How do you respond to a God who has intervened in such a wonderful, gracious way with worship, with praise? And that's exactly what they do. They come and they offer sacrifices to the Lord. Have a look there at verse 35. At that time, those who had come from captivity, the returned exiles, offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel. Twelve bulls for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, and as a sin offering, 12 male goats. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord. They also delivered the king's commissions to the king's satraps and to the governors of the province beyond the river, and they aided the people and the house of God." Folk, what do we learn from the eighth chapter of Ezra? Yes, I think there's some stuff to learn in terms of the priesthood. There's certainly some stuff to learn in terms of a dependency on God and not getting sucked into culture and so forth. Those, those lessons emerge for us. But I think the key thing that we want to put our finger on this evening is faith in action. Mm -hmm. This chapter teaches us that. It shows us that sometimes, just sometimes, it may well rejoice the heart of God 
if we're prepared to do something really daring for him. Are there times when we're called to, in a sense, throw caution and prudence to the wind and launch out based on just the authority of God's word and who he is and what he said that we should be doing, going in a sense with naked faith, trusting in his power to watch over us and to care for us and to provide for us. Doesn't this take us right back to where we started this evening? William Carey, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. What are we called to do in God's word? To walk by faith and not by sight? And yet in our sinfulness and our weak faith and our weak need, wobbliness and so forth, we want to walk by sight and not by faith. Yes, I know there's counterbalances to that in Scripture. There's, we need to apply prudence and wisdom, and we're called to responsible, wise living. That's, I mean, that's, that's clear. We've got the wisdom literature in the Old Testament that, that teaches us in that way. But, but is it possible that too often we uh, clothe and cloak our own fear and our lack of trust in this packaging of wisdom and prudence, and that uh, we actually stop trusting the Lord to do that which He alone can do. And I think this chapter, counterbalanced, or, or at least on the backdrop of William Carey, uh, shows us what it truly means to trust in the Lord, in his person, in his attributes, in his plans, in his province, providences, in his provisions, in his protection as well. Is this recklessness? I guess that would be the, the question mark uh, that would be asked and uh, maybe the finger pointed. Ezra didn't think so. Kerry didn't think so. Uh, for our men, uh, Oaks, you might remember a couple, good couple of years ago, we worked through David Platt's material, Radical Together, but, but the first book at an individual level was called Radical, just challenging people to step out in faith and actually do that which God has commanded us to do and to trust in Him to achieve His purposes through that begs the question, is there a willingness when the situation demands to show some Holy Spirit engendered boldness in terms of life and ministry? You think, for example, of Daniel, even just a couple of century, uh, centuries, decades earlier here in the, in the Persian Empire. What did he do? Thou shalt not pray. And Daniel went three times a day as per his custom and he opened his window and he prayed because he wanted to honor God in terms of that practice and not bow to the societal and legal pressure, even when the king had signed the decree against that. Was that cautious? Was that prudent? Was that reckless? Was that foolhardy? You make a call on that, but they're upheld for us in Scripture as examples of great faith. What about Paul? Uh, those of you in your fellowship groups who worked through Acts of the Apostles, what happened there in Acts chapter 14? Uh, Paul goes back into the city. He's already been stoned. He's already been left for dead. And he goes back into the same city to continue ministry. Was that the sensible thing to do? Surely you run as far as you can from that and uh, uh, avoid the danger. But he knew there was ministry to be done. And a trusting in the Lord went back and actually achieved benefit in those particular areas. So look, I'll leave that with you just to, to ponder on. There's a uh, no big stick uh, at play here this evening just to stir our thinking. I just want to stir our thinking. But the truth is that the principle of caution and prudence must always, in various circumstances, guide our Christian lives. That's true. But if we're always functioning in that way without a, a sense of the call of God and the purposes of God and the kingdom of God and the nature of God and uh, upholding a great faith in God, where would we be in terms of Christian ministry? Where would we be in terms of church planting? Where would we be in terms of international missions? I venture to say that we would have very few missionaries in times past that would have left their countries, left their creature comforts, left their families, and gone to plant the gospel in foreign countries. But they went expecting great things from God and attempting great things for God. Without people putting caution and prudence and personal safety and uh, um, family dynamics, etc., to the side, we wouldn't have the legacy of a William Carey, 
and a Dinarum Judson and a John Patton to the uh, what's it now Vanuatu Vun, uh, New Hebrides and Henry Martin to India as well and Hudson Taylor to China and David Brainerd to the North American Indians and David Livingston to Africa and uh, even Carl Hugo Gutcher the German Park Baptist pastor who left Germany uh, with a relatively safe environment and came. Uh, to be the first German missionary and pastor in the Eastern Cape, in the in the border area, and a lot of our Baptist heritage actually stems uh, from Gutsch's influence in in that area in Stadtheim and uh, uh, those areas, uh, King Williamstown, etc. Why? Because they expected great things for God and they attempted great things for Him, and the Lord extended His kingdom through them. What about the thousands who live out their faith today in countries where they face continual continual persecution? Last Sunday evening, this is a week ago, we were praying for Eritrea, and we looked, watched that video of Yael and her husband, who we heard about. It would be easy for them to give up. In fact, the pressure was on. Why don't you just recant, renounce Christ, give in? And yet by faith, attempting great things, expecting great things, and trusting in the Lord, uh, even when the prudent thing is to give in and to give up and to buckle and to bend, they said, no, we will continue to serve uh, irrespective of what actually happens and trust the Lord in that way. So, Fokka, can I just exhort you to let's pray along that theme, pray for ourselves, pray for our church, and let's proceed in life. Let's proceed in ministry with a faith in God and a faith in His Word and a faith in the promises of God, as indeed we're expecting great things from Him and attempting great things for Him. Folk, in a very real sense, and I would encourage you to pray uh, along this line even over the next week as we approach the QGM. This is something that Chris's treasurer and the finance calm and the leadership need to grapple with. Uh, this year, tomorrow evening, we're going to look at the, the budget as a leadership team. And folk, it's this perpetual balance between prudence and wisdom. Uh, at, but at the same time, that faith balance to say, for the cause of Christ and the kingdom, are we able to take faith steps? So uh, pray for this to be implemented in a very real way. This is not a theoretical devotion for this evening. Uh, we ourselves, as a, as a church and as a leadership, uh, and even as a church body next Sunday, need to keep this balance mm. between that which is sensible and prudent and well assessed, but at the same time being mindful of the fact that there is a very real faith balance uh, that we would need to be keeping. So uh, let's keep that in mind as well. Okay, I'm going to leave that with you. I'm going to stop the recording and then we can move to a time of prayer.